Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. In fact, it is the 150th webinar we've produced in this series and Bob will be announcing some cool giveaways to celebrate this occasion. And today Bob will discuss fostering a data literate culture with data governance. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. As always, we will send a follow-up email with in two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to our speaker for the series, Bob Seiner. Bob is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to start his presentation. Hello. And welcome and congrats on episode number 150. Holy cow, 150. That means we've been doing this for some time. Uh, <laughs> we won't talk about how long because I'm still not that old, but yes. Well, I'm going I'm to talk, talk about it a little bit. Can you, can you see my screen? Okay. Is my yeah. screen being shared with you? Okay, okay I just want yeah. to make sure. I don't know why I asked that after 150 times that we've done this. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar series. This is a great topic. I always joke with Shannon before the webinars about how every topic seems to be very relevant for the time that uh, when it, it actually hits on the calendar when we're giving it. Um, I wanna talk to you just real quickly before we get started about this being the 150th episode and how we came to that. So, um, 12 years, uh, 12 full years of webinars, plus the seven from this year, well, that would add up to, wait a minute, that would add up to 151. But there was a webinar way back in January of 2013 that for some health reasons, I was unable to do it. So this is actually the 150th episode. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for if you've been somebody who have been who has been joining us uh, throughout the years, we really appreciate um, your uh, your time and your attention to this uh, to this webinar series. Hey, um, Bob, you know what? I am going to point out something. You know, and after all of that conversation, it looks like I'm still sharing. It does look like you're still sharing. Yeah. Okay, hold on. See, that's why I asked. Yeah. So it looks like you're sharing. We're sharing the same thing. So you know, <laughs> you know details. We've been doing this for so long. We we think there we go. things all the time. Um, here we go. So I'm going to start over again. Hello, and no. No, I'm, not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But um, here, just to say again, we were talking about the 150th episode um, of the Real World Data Governance series. The 12 years of 12 episodes minus the one plus the the six for that. So this is the 150th. So we hope you'll continue to join the series. Um, like I said, this is a really important topic, but I want to get on a soapbox here for a minute before we get started. I'm not talking about a political soapbox or some type of a preachy soapbox, but I know that most of you or maybe all of you that are, uh, that are attending these webinars are governing your data. And so we should really ask our question, ourselves the question of why are we governing the data? Why are we integrating data? Why are we buying new systems, bringing data together? Why are we building data warehouses? Why are we talking about business intelligence? And even still, why are we talking about artificial intelligence? Well, it's because people want to be able to use the data better. They want to be able to speak with the data. They want to be able to communicate with the data better. And that's really what data literature is all about. So I'll get to the definitions here in a minute. But you can have the best data. You can have the best technology. If the people in the organization aren't literate in terms of data, you're not going to deliver to the level that you would probably most prefer to deliver to within your organization. So that's my my quick soapbox moment. But I mean, the, why, why are we doing all the things that we're doing? Well, because we want people to be able to use the data 
and make better use of the data and make better decisions. And you'll see that throughout the webinar today. Um, as I get started with each of these webinars, I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction. If you don't know me, well, we've been doing this webinar series. This is the 13th year of doing the webinar series. It's on the third Thursday of the month. And by Joe, it is the third Thursday of the month. So let's uh, let's get started. Um, next month, we're going to talk about the data scientist's role in governance success. So we seem to be pulling in a lot of topics about data quality, about data roles and responsibilities, and relating it to success in data governance. So today we're talking about fostering a data literature or data literate culture with data governance. Um, so again, the, the monthly webinar series, I've published a couple books on data governance. If you haven't checked them out yet, please go check them out. We're going to be giving away a copy of both of my books, plus uh, uh, we're going to be giving away a registration to an online learning plan through Dataversity's training center about non in one of these training uh, one of these learning modules that are listed here under my books. So um, we are going to randomly give away copies of each of these things to lucky people that are in the uh, in the audience today. Um, so I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance. I've written two books, one called Non-Invasive Data Governance and one called Non-Invasive Data Governance Strikes Again. Again, alluding that it must have struck once already in order for it to strike again. Uh, so those books are available at your favorite booksellers. Um, the online learning plans I just talked about, um, I my, the name of my company is KIK Consulting and Educational Services. KIK stands for Knowledge is King. And the idea of the consulting practice is to really transfer best practice knowledge to my clients in the areas that Shannon mentioned earlier, data governance, non-invasive data governance, stewardship, metadata management, and those types of things. In my spare time, I shouldn't really call it my spare time, I'm also an adjunct faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University, which is here in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, up until now, so for the last five cohorts of this program, it's been called the Chief Data Officer Program or the C-Data O Program. But beginning in the month of August, it's actually changing its name to the Chief Data and AI Officer Program. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll be glad to share it with you or look it up online. There's a lot of information that's available about it. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about in the webinar today fostering a data literate culture using data governance or with data governance. What's interesting is I had a client of mine refer to data literacy as being the fog. It kind of creeps in when you need to see something, but you can't see it exactly the way it is. It's kind of hanging out there. So that's the, the reason for the fog image in the background of, of this um, of this slide. But what are the topics I want to talk about today? The first thing I want to do, as I do with a lot of the webinars where we bring in another topic and relate it to data governance, I want to talk about understanding the link between data governance and data literacy. Talk about employ uh, empowering employees. Well, first of all, you know, one of the things that is, is really obvious to people is that um, with all this effort that they're putting into data, it's it's clear that they need that they need to uh, improve data, liter uh, data literacy within the organizations. So what I'm gonna do is as I'm getting started here, just start with a couple of quick definitions as I usually do. My definition of data governance is that it is the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data related assets. I know that definition makes a lot of people cringe because they don't like the words execute and enforce authority. But the truth is no matter what approach you take to data governance, whether it's a command and control kind of top-down approach, or you're taking a traditional, you know, if you build it, they will come type of approach to your governance program, or if you're going to take a non-invasive approach, which I will only talk about a little bit in this webinar, um, the truth is at the end of the day, you need to execute and enforce authority. The government's not coming to you. The regulatory bodies are not coming to you and telling you follow these things. If you choose, they're saying that you need to follow those things. And over the next few years, it's going to get to the point where they're going to want to audit you to not only have you saying, yes, you're doing these things, but to be able to prove that you're executing and enforcing the authority over data. So again, I know it's a word, it's worded quite strongly, 
But the truth is, um, I talk about following a non-invasive approach and people want to know how the heck can you be non-invasive and still execute and enforce authority? Well, check out some of the other webinars in the series because I've talked about that in a bit detail. So that's my definition of data governance. I'm sticking to it. Um, the definition that I use for data stewardship is that it is formal accountability for data. And the way I define a data steward is a person in the organization that has a relationship to the data as a definer or as a producer or as a user of the data that's being held formally accountable for how they define, produce, and use data. So basically, if you look up steward in the dictionary, it says that a steward is somebody who takes care of something for somebody else. That's literally the, di the, the dictionary definition or something very close to that. A data steward is just a person within your organization that has a relationship to the data that's being held formally accountable for that relationship and who's following through with that accountability. I'm often known to say that everybody in the organization potentially is a data steward and that organizations need to get over that. Well, the fact is that the only way that we're going to cover the entire organization is if we at least consider that anybody who has a relationship to the data that's being held accountable for it is a steward of the data. Okay, enough for that definition. Let's talk about the, the core topic for today's session, and that is data literacy. And I absolutely love this definition that comes from DEMA International. They seem to have some really well thought out definitions. Um, and it says that, that being data literate means to have that ability to read, write, communicate, and communicate data in context, including knowing where the data came from, the methods that are used to analyze that data, the techniques that can be applied. Becoming data literate is just like becoming literate, but becoming literate with data and being, being able to use the data as a communication tool. So the question you got to ask yourself is, are, do people already know how to do this? Do they already have the ability to read, write, and communicate with data? If they don't, then, uh, and I found in a lot of organizations that that's not a strong suit for them. So if you're going to actually implement data literacy, somebody is going to need to take the responsibility of helping to make the people of your organization data literate. And the truth is that a lot of the time that falls under the responsibility of whoever has responsibility for your data governance program. There are some organizations that create data literacy groups and data literacy programs. But again, I've seen that oftentimes the responsibility for data literacy actually falls under the, the people that the same people that have the responsibility for data governance. And so the, the, the definition goes on to say being data literate means to be able to work with data effectively, make informed decisions. Those are some words that you're going to see throughout this webinar, making decisions, making data-driven decisions, and then and communicating insight derived in a way that people in the organization can understand how what you're communicating with them and can actually take the appropriate actions with that, uh, with that, the, the information you're providing them. So these are the five topics I want to go through in the balance of the hour, leave some time for Q&A at the end. I want to first start by talking about the, the foundation of trustworthy data. And that's what data governance is all about. It's providing people with the trust in the data that they're using to make decisions, to operate, to, to provide their operations for the organization. And what I'm finding from many organizations is that if you ask people, they don't trust the data. At least they don't trust the data right now. So as we get better at governing the data and we're providing data understanding, that's the second thing I want to talk about um, through the metadata, that's going to help them to make better use of the data. And that better use of the data is going to drive improved decision making. Um, I want to talk about this, again, the link between data governance and data literacy and talk about promotion of data stewardship. You know, stewards need to be literate. In fact, there's something that I state a little bit later in the webinar that stewards can oftentimes be dependent on helping to transfer the knowledge that they have of working with data to the other people who don't recognize themselves as being stewards of the data. And then the last thing I want to talk about today, um, you know, in this subject is, um, is aligning with the organizational goals. 
even the Carnegie Mellon program that I'm I'm in, they start with the data strategy, making certain that we align our data. Uh, um, sorry, starts with a business strategy, and then from the business strategy, making certain that our data strategy aligns with the with the business strategy, and then setting organizational goals for data governance and data literacy that is going to help data governance to hit its mark. So these are, are a couple of topics that I want to talk about just in, in understanding the link between data governance and data literacy. So basically, data governance is the foundation of trustworthy data within the organization. You know, many organizations are implementing standards, they're implementing governing standards, they're implementing data, specific data standards. Well, the thing is that data governance, as we know, is not going to happen on its own. Somebody in the organization is going to have to have the responsibility for ensuring the accuracy, the consistency, the reliability of the data, for implementing the standards, uh, ensuring consistent practices. Most of these things fall under the auspices of data governance rather than data literacy. But that's really what we're trying to achieve with data governance is build that foundation of trustworthy data across the organization. Basically, as I said before, data governance is the foundation of trustworthy data, whether that's AI data, that's BI data, whether that's data that you're just using out of a spreadsheet in order to make the decisions that drive your company. So I talked a little bit about metadata and you know, there's I've talked a, a bit in these other webinars about metadata governance and how important it is to have well-documented metadata, have well-documented information about where the data comes from. Again, a lot of these actions fall under the responsibilities of data governance. You won't necessarily fall, find a, a data literacy program that is asking people to document their data to um, use metadata to, to clarify where the data came from and what's happened to the data as it's gotten to the source that we're using. So enhanced data understanding, that's one of the things that we understand that data governance is doing. And it's really, why are we doing it? We're doing it so that people can understand the data. People can read and they can, they can report from the appropriate data, but it's difficult to do if you don't have well-documented well-documented data in your organization. So we know that in order to become data literate, people need to trust the data, they need to understand the data. Metadata management needs to be a big part of that. So enhancing data understanding needs to be a, a big part of that. Two words that you're gonna see together throughout the webinar are decision-making. And that just that seems to be, that was in the definition of data literacy was why are we doing this so that we can be better at decision making within our organization. So, um, like I said, I, I talk about decision making in the definition of data literacy um, or of being data literate. Data governance is oftentimes again responsible for those three bullets: empowering the employees with with data literacy, being potentially responsible for the data literacy program itself, but providing them with access to the data, providing them with the metadata, doing all of the things that need to be aligned in order to help them to improve their ability to make decisions. So data literacy actually leads to improved decision-making. I said on the previous slide that data governance led to enhanced data understanding. Understand how these things need to work together. So you've got improved decision-making, you've got enhanced data understanding. Now we can see how we're starting to get the people in the organization to become data literate. Another thing to talk about in terms of understanding the link between data governance and data literacy is the promotion of data stewardship. Again, this seems to be a very data governance oriented activity. However, I don't know of any of my clients right now that are actually implementing data governance that aren't also talking about data literacy, that aren't also in the mode of identifying and recognizing who their stewards are and prom promoting those stewards um, to help them become more literate and to use the data more to their advantage. So you notice I use the word recognize data stewards to guide and educate employees. I talked about that a little bit before. Oftentimes it's the people who are literate with the data already who can be very beneficial to those people in the organization who are not yet as data literate as they need to be. And I use the term recognize 
instead of assigning data stewards, I try to stay away from the term assign because if you're assigned something immediately, it feels over and above what you're presently doing. So we're gonna recognize data stewards based on their relationship to the data and understand what level of literacy they have and, and recognize and use that ability to be able to guide and educate other employees within the organization. Data stewards promote effective data usage and understanding, encourage data literacy. We need to get the data stewards of our organization activated. And I know many organizations are in the process of doing that. Again, I said that potentially everybody in the organization could be a data steward, and we need to potentially at least recognize that because again, I'm not gonna take 50 of you in this webinar that use data that is sensitive and say that you need to protect it while the other 50 of you who also use the sensitive data say you don't have to protect it. It's based on your relationship to the data and we need to get stewards to understand that they are stewards, whether or not we call them stewards, they are accountable for the actions that they take with data throughout the organization. Um, the last item I wanted to mention in this subject, on the understanding the link between governance and literacy is that's that thing that I mentioned earlier, which is aligning with organizational goals. Sometimes that starts with understanding what your business strategy is, making certain that your data strategy aligns with your business strategy, and then making certain that your organizational goals for data governance and data literacy align within that data strategy. So as I said before, this is, this is absolutely critical. This is the first thing that a lot of the, the chief data officer, officer certificate programs are teaching is, you know what, unless you align your data strategy and the things that governance and literacy are doing to your, your business strategy, it, the chances are that, that you're not gonna get as much uh, support sponsorship as you, you typically would get from the leadership of your organization. So aligning with the goals of the organization is important. Data governance often focuses on, you know, showing how data literacy can help drive business success and growth. It has to be somebody within the organization. If it's not your data governance program, I'd be really curious as to who it is in your organization is that has the responsibility for data literacy. Again, just remember, we're, we're basically just starting with the relation. Many of the organizations that are building data literacy programs are, are still in the their infancy, are still getting started with their data literacy programs. All right, let's talk about, um, you know, it's one thing to draw the connection between data governance and data literacy. Um, the question really becomes, how do we activate our stewards? How do we empower our stewards? Well, one of those ways is through education and training. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of the different ways that organizations that have been successful with data literacy have been educating the stewards, educating the stakeholders, educating the people that are not necessarily as literate in the data as they need to be. And so a couple of those ways that organizations are doing it, they're tailoring training programs, they're creating interactive workshops, they're providing access to learning resources that might be outside of your organization. Data diversity is a perfect example of a learning resource that people could go to to learn more about data literacy, data modeling, anything that you want in terms of data, but we need to consider there's internal learning resources and there's also external re learning resources. So we need to consider both of those when we're empowering our employees, our stewards through education and training. There's mentorship and support networks. Again, they could be internal and they could be external as well. There are groups that are forming around doing specific analytics around specific types of data that aren't within your organization. More public groups that are looking for members to support each other and to mentor each other. Because again, all these things that people are trying to do with data, they're not all brand new but a lot of them and a lot of the technologies that are available to them are new. So again, sharing ideas becomes very beneficial. And then recognizing and providing incentives to people to become data literate. And I'll talk in a little bit here about, um, about rewarding those people um, who are, are, are taking the time, making the effort to become more literate. 
So I talked about the internal and the external. Internal, oftentimes, you know, you can build these things where there's collaboration and cooperation between people amongst amongst the people within your organization. And the external is, well, sometimes the skills are better received from outside the organization. So I'll go into that a little bit more here in a couple of minutes. So one of the first things that we can do to empower employees through education and training is to develop tailored training programs. And I don't want to read all the slides to you. I know I, I underlined a whole bunch of the words here, but I think you could do that yourself. Developing and implementing training, making certain that it's appropriate for the different audiences that you're asking to become educated in data literacy or educated in the data. Um, designated role-specific training. So you might want to train your strategic level one way while training your tactical and operational people another way. There's not just necessarily one way. First of all, all people don't like to be trained the same way. They don't like to be educated the same way. So tailor your training programs. There's a lot of tools that are now available on the market. One is a, a, a product called Data Camp. I'm not here to promote any products, but there's other learning management systems that organizations are taking advantage of and creating tailored training programs to help people to understand how to better communicate with their data. So developing customized education paths, you know, as needed, depending on who the audience is that you're trying to get to become data literate. And in some organizations, that's basically everybody in the organization, if they truly <clears throat> wanna become data driven, well, then you're gonna to need to have customized education paths to make certain that the different people at different levels of the organization with different knowledge levels are being educated in such a way that it makes sense that they're actually getting something out of the training programs that you're providing to them. Another way to empower your employees is through interactive workshops and seminars. And the most important word that I at least think is on this slide is the word hands-on. I think it's on here a couple of times. Yeah, it is on here a couple of times. It is, you know, I find this actually to be the most effective way of educating or, uh, or bringing multiple people together at one time and helping them to hands-on learn how to use the tools, hands-on learn how to use those techniques that they may not be aware of, of how to analyze and how to promote the data that they're working with. So promoting, uh, having hosting hands-on workshops, you know, basically people learn better by doing. And, um, you know, using the seminars to demonstrate practical data tools and techniques, things that they may not be aware of that are available to them, creating interactive sessions where they can build confidence in, in some real world applications of using data and data governance and using their literacy level to, um, to, to build confidence in the data that they're reporting and that they're working with within the organization. Another way to empower employees is through access to learning resources. I mentioned before, there's internal learning resources that organizations create and then they record and they make available to people throughout the organization. And then there's a whole bunch of, of external types of learning resources as well. There's groups that are forming that are taking employees from organizations and helping them to become more data literate, to understand what some of the analysis techniques are, to know what questions they should be asking about the data and how they should be protecting the data effectively for their organization. So providing access to learning resources, that's really an important way to help to empower the employees through education and training in your organization. This is one that I'm finding to be more and more useful within organizations. Organizations are creating these networks of people. They're creating communities of practice. They're creating um, centers of excellence where people can work together and learn from each other. Again, the idea of uh, the organizations that are being more successful than those that are not being as successful are using the strength of the people within the organization to mentor other people within the organization. So it grows internally that way. Certainly you can join support networks outside of your organization, but just like this image of the guy kind of pulling the other guy up, um, that's what organizations are trying to do as they're trying to become more data literate 
And as they're finding that there's a misbalance between those people that are data literate and those people that, you know, have an interest in becoming data literate and need to become data literate, we need to take advantage of the internal things within the organization. Again, like I said, the communities of practice, the centers of excellence, the user groups, or even the individual support. If somebody has a question about how to use data, who do they go to? You know, believe it or not, that's metadata. We need to make that information available to data to people so that they understand and that they're getting the support that they need in order to become more data literate within their organization than your organization. And the last thing I want to talk about here is the recognition and the incentives. I mean, we need to understand that people have day jobs. People are busy more than 100% of the time, that if they're going to dedicate any of their time to becoming more data literate, again, like I said earlier, we're putting a lot of money, we're putting a lot of effort into improving our data situation, even if it's just specifically for AI or for business intelligence. Um, People need to be need to know what data exists. They need to know how to use it, how to analyze it. So we need to incentivize them in order to get them to leave their comfort zone because this might not be something that they're already comfortable with. So we need to recognize and reward employees who demonstrate a higher level of data literacy and the application of the principles of data governance within their part of the organization. So like I said, implementing rewards for employees that are excelling in data literacy, recognizing achievements. Um, had an organization not too long ago that designated people as they went through data governance training as data deputies. And then, um, then as they became more literate and as they went through more training and they demonstrated they were able to use the things that they were being taught they evolved from becoming data deputies to becoming data sheriffs. And the, and the little badge, the silver badge that they were given to, remember when people used to be in the office, they used to clip it to their cubicle. Well, now people are actually putting these rewards or these badges on their screens as they're talking to other people within the organization. They have now been recognized as a data deputy or a data sheriff. Again, it's, it's gamification to a certain extent, but we need to make it interesting to people. And again, we're looking to empower our employees and do that through education and training. Why don't we recognize and provide incentive to the people within the organization so that they will take the time to become more data literate, to understand what governed data means and what role they play in the governance of the data. All right, we're on to the third section. So we're talking about embedding a data-driven mindset across the organization. These are really five very important topics, and I'm going to go through each of them in detail. But the leadership commitment, I think I've mentioned in my webinars that I've given on data governance best practices, that the number one best practice for standing up and sustaining a data governance program in 100% of my clients. I'm not talking 98, 95%, 100% of them agree that senior leaderships, support sponsorship, and most importantly, understanding is necessary in order for their data governance and their data literacy programs to not become at risk. So let me repeat that again. So senior leadership support, sponsor, and understand what the heck data governance is and why it's important. They understand what data literacy is and how all these investments we're making in the data aren't necessarily gonna be beneficial, as beneficial to the organization as we like if the people in the organization are not data literate in order to take advantage of that data. You know, integrating into data, data uh, daily operations, that's what non-invasive data governance is all about building governance into what people do. I always say, if you consider data governance a game, you've won the game when data governance and the data governance activities have been built into people's daily operations. Cross-department collaboration, working with other people, you know, knowing their data, solving problems at a tactical level rather than just at an operational level. Again, building this into what people do. We need to build the data-driven mindset into what people do across the organization. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Like I said, the leadership commitment, that is of the utmost importance. 
Um, as I said, it's not just a best practice for standing up data governance programs. It seems to be the number one best practice because organizations recognize that it is possible to get your leadership to support, sponsor, and understand if you're making the effort to do that. But they also understand that if you don't have their commitment, your program is going to be at risk. I would say that I would say that for that would be hold true for your data governance program and for your your data literacy program. So, you know, I, I put on here that leaders should actively champion data-driven decision-making practices. And I ask you to ask yourself, how much is that actually taking place? How much are the people in the how are the, the leaders in your organization actively championing data governance and actively championing um, data literacy. You know, they say that they want the organization to become data driven, but where I'm seeing it fall down quite a bit is that people aren't necessarily willing to use their position within the organization to drive that point home across the organization. So I think that's something that we could focus on if we can get more leadership commitment but we could also get people that are in positions where people are going to listen to what they have to say to actively champion the data-driven decision-making culture of the organization. Um, I talk about model used to illustrate impact on data. Um, the most important aspect from this slide is, or thing from this slide is, um, what can we do as practitioners to get our leaders to actually actively champion the things that we're doing? And it comes back to that first best practice of supporting, sponsoring, and understanding. It's easy to give support. It's easy to sponsor if you're willing to maybe cough up a few dollars to help. But understanding is where they're really lacking. Um, why do we need data literacy? Why do we need data governance? There's still organizations today that are creating their AI governance strategies and not incorporating data and data governance into those strategies. I think that's going to be a hot topic at uh, part of the DGIQ, the AI governance conference in December um, for data diversity. So leadership commitment, we need to embed uh, data-driven mindsets across the organization. Oftentimes it starts with our, our leadership's commitment to this and their ability, ability to be able to use their position to, in, to enforce those ideas across the organization. Um, one way to, to embed data-driven mindset um, is to integrate um, data governance into your data and into your daily operations. As I mentioned before, um, if data governance is a game, it becomes, you've won the game when it just becomes second nature to people in what they're doing. So we need to not make data governance feel like it's something extra. Um, it's not an add-on. It's not over and above the things that they're presently doing. It is actually what they are doing. So they're defining and producing and using data as part of their job. We need to build the governance of the definition of the data, build the governance of the production and the usage of the data into their daily operations. And that's one way just to build that data-driven mindset into the organization. So incorporating governance tasks into their daily tasks, using data-related metrics, embedding governance practices within standard operating procedures. Again, these are all ways that we can integrate the data-driven mindset into the organization. Cross-departmental uh, collaboration. Um, again, another way to embed the data-driven mindset is to encourage cross-departmental collaboration. Encourage collaboration between departments to share what they're doing, share how they are becoming data literate, how they are using data literacy to communicate better with data. Again, I talked about the internal and the external aspects of data literacy and even mentoring and helping each other from within. The organizations that are standing out are those that are taking advantage of those people that are literate and using what they know to share insights, share best practices, you know, so that other people in the organization can come up to that same level of data literacy. Facilitating cross-departmental data. And again, these things don't happen. People talk about organizations operating in silos. We need to break down some of those silos. And one way to do it is to encourage cross-departmental collaboration. Data-driven, another way to embed a data-driven mindset is through data-driven goal setting. 
So make sure that whatever goals that you're setting for the organization, they rely on data. They rely on data analysis and insights. So make certain that those goals that you're setting for the organization, they're data driven. And make certain that you know where the data is going to come from, that you have trust in the data, and that people are communicating about that data effectively. So someone needs to promote the successes in the organization. So when, when somebody has, meet, has met a goal for becoming data-driven, that needs to be shared across the organization. Don't assume that other people are going to know. Don't assume that other people in the organization are going to know that one department is getting very data literate and is able to communicate with their data effectively when other parts of the organization are not able to do that. And this is a term that I haven't used, I haven't heard used in a long time, the idea of continuous improvement. But I guess it's never really gone away. I remember my father, he used to work for a large corporation here in Pittsburgh, and he was always on the quality improvement committee, and they were always doing continuous improvement. You know, this seems to be kind of old fashioned, but since most organizations are starting from a pretty weak state in terms of data governance and, and in terms of data literacy, um, it's now become more important. We need to start measuring our improvement and, and, and showing that we're continuously improving and taking action to improve people's understanding of governance, improve people's literacy uh, in terms of how they can communicate with data across the organization. So again, this is just another way to embed data-driven mindset is just start to promote a culture of continuous improvement. The next subject I wanted to talk to you about today is leveraging a data governance framework. Now, I know we're running out of time in the webinar, and oftentimes when I start to mention the term framework, I'm going to start, I share with you the non-invasive data governance framework. You can see it in other webinars. I'm not going to really talk about that today, except for in terms of the core components of what typically goes into a data governance framework. And the core components of my framework are the data itself, the roles and responsibilities, the processes, the communications, the metrics, and the tools. And if you look at these five subjects under leveraging the data governance framework, well, the first one has to do with data. The second one has to do with tools. The third one has to do with roles. The fourth one has to do with processes. And again, I would lump the fifth one, the policies and procedures under tools as well. Um, the, the only thing that's really not recognized here in these five bullet points are the metrics. And we just talked about the importance of having data-driven metrics in order to become more data literate and to, uh, in, and to install a, a governed data environment within the organization. So let's talk about these. So the first thing an uh, organization needs to do is choose a framework. It says utilize data governance frameworks. Maybe it's not multiple frameworks. Maybe it's the one that resonates and that you feel will be most effective to you and your organization. But use a framework to establish and maintain the things that are most important to the organization. Here, we're talking about improving standard data definition. So create uniform data definitions. Again, these things aren't going to happen on their own. These things require data governance. Typically, you're not going to find that there's five definitions to a critical data element within your organization, and then all of a sudden it changes to, oh, we're all on the same page. We're all calling it the same thing. We're all using it the same way. No, that doesn't happen. There needs to be an effort. We need to create uniform definitions in order to improve the understanding so that people have more trust in the data and that they can become more literate in how they use the data across the organization. So these things, creating uniform data, implementing clear terminology in a business glossary or something like that, these are all things that are the responsibility of data governance. And you can utilize the data governance framework in order to do that. Um, another thing that we can do, another way to um, to leverage data framework, data governance frameworks is to create a comprehensive data catalog. Um, I'm not going to talk to you a lot about data catalogs in this session today, but I've had conversations with clients even this week that say that they they're having trouble getting funding for something that's going to capture all their knowledge, uh, all their process, all their flow of data. They're having trouble coming up with. Um, coming up with money to be able to, to acquire one of these for their organization. 
The truth is that the organizations, again, that are becoming more successful in becoming data literate and being more successful in their data governance programs are implementing data catalogs. So again, people need to know what data exists. They need to know where it is. They need to know how to access it. And all of those things are going to take place within your, uh, within your data catalog. And again, the, the catalog may just be one bridge in your framework, a tool, bri a tool bridge that is useful at many different levels of the organization. So again, leveraging your, your data governance framework, you can use that to drive literacy initiatives by formalizing how people are capturing definitions and um, lineage and those types of things. Um, another, thing, another thing that you might wanna also collect within your data catalog is who the owner of the data is, who the stewards of the data are. The roles and responsibilities of a data governance program are the backbone of a successful governance program. So again, if we're gonna leverage our framework to drive literacy initiatives within our organization, one of the things that we need to do is be very clear about our roles and responsibilities, defining clear ownership and stewardship of the data. And that's across the organization. Again, unless you're starting just incrementally expanding it across the organization, at some point in time, you're gonna to wanna to know for at least your most important data assets, who is the quote unquote owner of that data who are the people that are taking care of that data for the organization? Data quality management is, again, another way to leverage your framework is to make certain that as you're flushing out the data and how it's being viewed across the different levels of the organization, as you're implementing data quality management, implementing strict data quality standards. When I went back and reread this slide and I had the word strict in there, I said that, boy, that doesn't really sound too non-invasive to me. But the truth is organizations are setting up data quality standards and they're not strictly enforcing them. So the standards almost become additional paper to the organization. Unless we actually start to ensure the accuracy and the reliability of the data by using the, the quality standards, there needs to be some strict force of execution and enforcement. I talked about that earlier with my definition of data governance. It is the execution and enforcement of authority. Well, in order to improve data quality, we need to be strict. We need to follow the standards that we in our organization are defining. Data governance and data, data, poli um, data governance policies and procedures. Again, another way to leverage your framework to drive your literacy initiatives. I know of several organizations that have created data literacy policies and they've gotten them signed off on the, the highest level of the organization because they understand the importance of taking the existing knowledge base of the people within the organization and improving their ability to be able to work with data. To do all those things that DEMA included in their definition of what it means to become data literate. So oftentimes it's policies and procedures that are built into your framework as some of those tools that demonstrate the executive leadership support and sponsorship and understanding of the need for governance and for literacy within your organization. And I know I only have a couple minutes left here. I just wanna run through a couple examples, uh, actually a handful of examples of organizations that are starting to do this. And now I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you that all of these organizations that I'm, I'm gonna talk about here have excelled in data literacy, but I wanna share with you what their intentions are and their intentions of combining data governance and data literacy, or at least having them partner together. So since there's a lot of organizations that are still relatively new, even at data governance, but also at data literacy, Keep that in mind as I talk about each of these different case studies. We're going to start with one in financial services. This was a banking system in the Midwest that was looking to improve the things that you see on the screen. Read the first line. It said that, they, that data governance and data literacy through robust data governance and literacy programs, they partnered these, th these, these two things together. So when people were talking, it, it was actually part of their data literacy program to get people to understand what data governance was and why it was important and why it wasn't this big threatening behemoth that people think about in terms of data governance. But they, they made it part of their literacy program 
to educate people on what data governance is and why it was important and why it is important. And then the last bullet here, that's what their targeted goal was to achieve higher profitability and satisfaction by becoming a data-driven, as I said, that's gonna be mentioned a lot in this webinar, a data-driven organization and making data-driven decisions. Again, that's their target. Check back with me in a year. I'll check back with them and see if they're actually able to use data governance and data literacy to help them to get there. Another one I wanna talk about is a healthcare organization. This was uh, basically on the East Coast. Um, this, this program was run by their chief medical and information officer, CMIO, and he recognized that the organization didn't, there were only pockets of people in the organization that understood how to, to communicate effectively with the data. They also recognized that they were lacking in some of the things that data governance can do to help to improve the data literacy of the organization, including metadata management, including creating groups that could kind of counsel and aid each other within the organization. So again, their goal, their targeted goal was to achieve regulatory compliance and better health outcomes. They were actually heading in that direction, but they're not there yet because again, data literacy has not been talked about for that long. Data governance has been talked about for a long time. It's really only AI that's bringing data governance back to the, to the forefront. Um, a retail, uh, I'll give you a retail example. This is a convenience store chain. Again, what they were trying to do was leverage data literacy and governance together to optimize certain things that were key and critical to their operations, like optimizing inventory, personalizing marketing efforts, um, all of these things they were trying to do, but they recognized that the data wasn't necessarily optimized to the point where people had trust in it. Um, and people didn't necessarily know how to use the data when they did have trust in the data. I'm going to go through these next three real quickly. A public sector uh, organization was also trying to do the same thing. This was in the federal government space. Again, as I said, every organization that is looking to become data driven um, is talking about data governance, is talking about making certain that the people of the organization are literate in terms of what we've described earlier in this webinar. And they're just, just in the process now of rolling out some of the tools I talked about earlier, but also getting people in the organization to take courses, to take workshops, to come together and to speak about how they can become more data literate. A tech company, this is a gaming company that was again, looking to foster a data literate culture, um, but it, it was based on the trust that people had in the data. The last, so that's actually the last example I wanted to share with you. So we're we're basically at time. I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to see if there's any questions today. But just real quickly, the first thing I talked about was creating that link between data governance and literacy. You know, things that we can do. I shared some ideas with for empowering employees through different types of education and training. Trying to build data governance and data literacy into what people do instead of making it feel like it's something that's over and above leveraging the frameworks, or if you have a framework, using a framework, pulling out the core components and making certain that they are in good order in order to drive data literacy initiatives. And then real quickly at the end, I went through a bunch of examples of how organizations are pulling together data literacy and uh, data governance in order to improve their culture and become more data-driven and, and focus on data-driven decision-making. With that, Shannon, I know I went a little bit over. Do we have any questions about what I just talked about? <laughs> Always. We've got great questions and great engagement from the community and the attendees here. So, uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and any questions we don't get time to get a chance to get answered uh, live right now. But let me dive in, Bob. Um, do you think making data literacy training mandatory, like information security, cybersecurity type training is mandatory at most organizations? Um, I say organizations that measure the number of people that have gone through data literacy training. I don't know about mandating it. I would think, I mean, the easy answer to that question is yes, it should be mandated. Anybody who's doing data analysis, anybody who's trying to communicate effectively with data, um, that should be part of their 
certification in their role if there is such a thing. So it could potentially be mandatory. Um, I'm not finding it to be mandatory yet in most organizations, but the ones that are creating these programs and starting to roll out data literacy, they are measuring the number of people that have gone through those sessions and, and the ones that are actually applying what they're learning in those sessions. So it's not gonna be until your executive leadership think that it's important enough for everybody to become data literate that they're gonna, that it could become mandatory. So yes, I think it would be a good idea no, I'm not seeing it happen. Got it. And, you know, Bob, this question isn't re directly related to the topic, but um, within data governance, the terms like procedure, processes, rules, and standards are confusing. Can this be clarified with some good examples? I don't have the examples right in front of me to share with you right now, but yes, they can. I have a client right now that actually every term that is used in their standard, every terms that is used in their policy that might not be understood is very clearly defined. So I agree that the data industry is potentially one of those industries that uses more terms that people don't understand. Like what's the difference between a standard and a guideline and a policy and a procedure and those types of things. There's many organizations that have a distinct hierarchy of those things. So I don't have the answers for you. If you put them in the questions, I can try to throw some definitions back at you, but I could think that you could find those on your own. I'd say, yes, it's very important to define those things if you're going to use them, even as I did within the webinar. I can't define every term I use, <clears throat> but I mean, I think it's a good idea for organizations to define them when they're using them in their policies and procedures. Love it, thank you. So um, Bob, can you give examples of metrics to be used to influence data-driven mindsets? Metrics to drive David data-driven mindsets. Well, I would, again, I'm going to fall back on, and if other people have other ideas, please share it within the chat. Um, coming down to, to strictly to, quantif to, to have numbers that you can actually quantify, you know, many organizations are just at the position now where they're measuring the number of people that are attending these things, how much time they're spending on education. They're not spending as much time measuring what's the impact of the of the training? I think that's something that's going to be coming in the near future. I'm not sure I, I answered your question, but um, I gave it my best. <laughs> I like it. So, uh, Bob, um, could you, we revisit the healthcare example shared, you know, how can one achieve data literacy program amidst a drive towards AI whilst data quality is bad? and a data governance council is not fully established. Wait, can you read that again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we revisit the healthcare example that you shared? Um, and the question specifically towards that is how can one achieve a data literacy program amidst uh, a drive towards AI whilst data quality is bad and a data governance council is not fully established? How do you move towards AI without data good data quality? Uh, and well, a data governance council. Do it less, less effectively than you could if you did have good data quality, because again, go back to the trustworthiness in the data. I mean, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's this, this um, healthcare company wasn't that company, but there are companies that are creating their executive steering groups that are creating executive councils to focus on AI and on AI governance yet they're not even incorporating the term data into their AI governance strategy. And they're certainly not talking about the importance and the need to have data governance. Um, data quality, yeah, I'd say those organizations that are trying to implement AI solutions with data that people don't trust, data that can't be verified and validated are taking a big risk. If they're wanting to become data data driven decision making within their organization, they're going to become data driven decision makers based on data that's not of high quality. So I would say it's um, you need to start you, you need to invoke data governance and data management into your AI strategies. You need to if you don't have a data governance council, that's a good thing to begin with. 
I would guess that if you can educate people at that level, I mentioned earlier in the webinar, you know, getting executive level support. Well, it's also important to get strategic level support within the organization. If you do create a steering committee, if you do create uh, a data governance council, let's educate them on why, if we're going to look to implement AI, where data fits into the picture and why, in fact, I just published a couple of articles on LinkedIn, why you don't want to implement AI without data quality. Wow, that was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, but it was a very good answer and very appropriate, but that does bring us to the top of the hour and I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you everybody so much for engaging in the 150th uh, production of this <laughs> webinar series. We're very excited to have you here. We will randomly draw some winners for the prizes that Bob selected and contact you with the winners with those prizes. So thank you so much and hope you all have a great day. And again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording and answers to all the questions that we didn't have time to get to. And Thanks, y'all. My last note is see you for number 151 next month. Absolutely. I love right. it. Take Thanks, care, everybody. Thanks. Bye.